center some is, is the, was, did the midterm already happen or were you able to send her some tips no, today? No, no, she had it was she was okay, yeah. Yeah. Professor uh, yeah. she really likes being so oh she right. missed it by that much <laughs> Thank you everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Only one. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. We need a little more energy. <laughs> it's a bright, sunny, first day of spring morning. Thank you all for coming. My name is Ryan Sudo, Government Affairs at Fair Vote, a nonpartisan election organization uh, that researches and advances reforms to make democracy more functional and representative for every American. Uh, we're here to introduce and celebrate the Fair Representation Act. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, our first speaker, uh, we wouldn't be here without him, uh, Representative Don Byer. Uh, Don Byer is a representative from Virginia's 8th. Uh, he's been there since 2015. Uh, he first co-sponsored the Representation Act in a 115th Congress. In each session, it has gained more co-sponsors, and we hope the same for uh, for this version. Um, and we've been in in that time that he's introduced the first Fair Representation Act, we've seen incredible growth in ranked choice voting and proportional representation. Uh, so, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Representative Don Byer. for joining us for the reintroduction of the Fair Representation Act. As Ryan says, it's been a long journey, um, but we get closer every single year. If some bills are about money, and some bills are about like wonky policy treats, <laughs> this Fair Representation Act, though, is about vision. Uh, the wonderful best speaker of all time, Nancy Pelosi, says, it's not enough to be on the right side of history. we be on the right side of the future, too. This is exactly where we are. It's a vision of a healthier democracy that is more representative and less polarized. The Fair, Represent Fair Representation Act strengthen our democracy and our Congress, give every American a voice, and encourage candidates from consistently underrepresented groups to run with newly leveled playing fields. I'm constantly pointing out to my Republican friends that if you live in the city of Alexandria, where I do, so it's very I love it, but we're seven and zero on city council. Um, so the Republicans who live in Alexandria have no voice at all, except the one little ones that would pay attention. To that. The exact same thing is true in places where gerrymandering and the uh, Duverger's law. I know this is not in my remarks. <laughs> the, the French political economist who says that single-member districts of plurality voting will automatically lead to highly polarized two-party systems. This is exactly what we have. Look, here's how it works. As institute ranked choice voting for the election of every member of Congress, both the House and the Senate. Second, it would establish multi-member districts for House elections and replace winner-take-all elections with proportional representation. I fear the election that's coming up in Virginia's 10th district on June 18th, where we have 12 candidates running in a primary, which mathematically someone could win with 8.3% of the vote, which means 91% didn't want that person to be there. And, and I was also thrilled last year that in the Arlington races, the primary for two seats in the Arlington County Board, um, there's six candidates, something like 82% of the people in Arlington voted for one of the two winners because of ranked choice voting. So almost everyone was represented in terms of their vote. And then third, those districts will be established by a nonpartisan redistricting process pending the anti-democratic process of gerrymandering. We've seen with fair vote statistics again and again that you have roughly the same number of Democrats and Republicans as you have now, but they would be differently, come from different parts of the country, and they also would be much less likely to represent the extremes, either the right or the left. You have people fighting for the middle rather than fighting to win the front the benefits of these, these reforms enacted together is greater than the sum of the individual parts. Today, many members of Congress effectively win seats in non-competitive votes, non-competitive districts by convincing small numbers of committed partisans to vote for them in low turnout primaries to multiple candidates. 
And then you often, as I just mentioned, produce a winner who has far less than popular and majority support. And since the vast majority of these congressional seats are rated as non-competitive, to keep those seats, members have to keep their partisan primary electorate happy, not much the larger constituency they're supposed to serve. I just came back yesterday afternoon from a, a Ways and Means field hearing in Dallas. So I spent a lot of time on the bus with my Republican friends. It's amazing how many things we agree upon sitting together on a bus. <laughs> but they cannot come here and vote that way because of the, the pain and suffering they would suffer in their district, in their primary. Basically, the, the new motto that's thrown at Grand Capitol Hill right now is, is vote no, hope yes, um, which is what so many of them are doing. They want it to pass, they can't pass because we don't have the fair representation. As a result, we have members of Congress today who advocate for political violence, openly subscribe to QAnon conspiracy theories, or even call for the overturning of American elections and the establishment of martial law. This is not what our founders wanted for us. And our bill would change the political incentives and make representatives answerable to a much larger elector, much larger than their little primary members. By the way, there's an old rule in politics that people like Norm Morrissey know very well that people who vote in primaries are people who vote in primaries. It's a pretty fixed set of people. And once you understand who they are, you don't need to go outside. <coughs> Those non competitive primaries, in fact, all primaries, would go away and be replaced by a system that would give every voter a say and every member of Congress a reason to cater to the median voter rather than the fringe. The establishment of multi-member districts for congressional elections with requirements for nonpartisan redistricting would create more opportunities for Americans across the political spectrum to be represented, allowing for an area's political right, political left, and political center, each to earn their fair share of representation in Congress. By the way, as you probably know, every place they put ranked choice voting in place, more women, more people of color, more people across the political spectrum actually get to participate. Okay. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. <laughs> also mitigate vote splitting and the spoiler effect, and effectively end the need for positive runoff elections. Combining this approach to electing the House with ranked choice voting would prevent any vote from going to waste and lead to the selection of candidate with the widest support and the deepest support. These reforms made by the Fair Representation Act would make representatives much more reflective of their districts. And our bill is packed is backed by virtually every public in election, starting with Norm Ornstein, across the political spectrum from left to right, and the election reformers, and many of them who join us today. So um, thank you very much for being part of this. This is in virtually every meeting, town hall meeting, I spoke to the sweetest cultural exchange yesterday. The, the question goes up, what do we do to fix Congress? It's broken, we know it, and uh, the answer is the fair representation. So thank you. issue, Rashad Robinson is the president of Color of Change, a racial justice organization with more than 7 million members who demonstrate the power of black communities every single day. Welcome, Rashad Robinson. I am so excited to be here. Thank you so much, Representative, for your leadership. Thank you to Fair Vote, and I am here mostly because of the collision course that we've already been on and all the ways in which the voices and the power and the ability for black communities to be truly represented in our democracy is not simply under threat, but it is in peril. Our current system was not designed for the diversity that we have in our country right now. The single member district structure does not actually make it so that our, all of our voices are heard. And we are constantly trying to divide up a pie that is not actually designed to be divided. So the results that we get in our Congress are the results that are based on the system that we actually have. 
And so that is not just enough for us to work every single election to turn people out, to tell them that their vote matters when they're voting inside of districts where their vote actually doesn't matter, that we have a system that time and time again, we tell people a story about their vote. We tell people a story about their power that is actually not fully true. We all want to be heard and counted and visible in our society, regardless of whether we are privileged or vulnerable, in the majority or the minority or in favor or out of favor with whoever may be in power in that moment. And the Fair Representation Act helps us get closer to that reality. Amen. Every single day at Color of Change, we are working to make black folks powerful because that is part of how we make democracy work. All of us want to be powerful and we're working to raise voices on issues like criminal justice, making sure our economy works for everyone, making sure that at the end of the day, people are able to be heard in terms of uh, their ability to vote, making sure that they're heard at their school boards, making sure that we have conversations and accountability on the biggest corporations in our society. And in day in and day out, we have to recognize that it's not just about building presence, it's about building power. And power is the ability to change the rules. And sometimes it's the unwritten rules and sometimes it's the written rules. And we are here today because we recognize that as much as we want to be present in our democracy, when we recognize that the system simply isn't designed for that, we have to do the work to actually change the rules. And that's what this is all about. Changing the rules because at time and time again, our democracy has changed. Time and time again, we have recognized the failures and the flaws and we have expanded the franchise. We have made new rules to make sure that we can make sure people are truly heard and counted. And this is just another important moment. It is broken and so we have to fix it. And that is why we are here today. I wanna to once again thank everyone who's here, who's standing up, who's working to move this conversation forward because this at the end of the day is one of the most important things that we have to do. To not simply ask people to show up, but to do the work every single today to make sure they are showing up to a system that actually matters. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Rashad. Our next speaker is Norman Ornstein. Norman Ornstein is a senior fellow emeritus at the American Enterprise Institute, where he has been studying politics, elections, and the U.S. Congress for more than four decades. Please welcome Dr. Ornstein. Actually, more than five decades now. <laughs> uh, first, is it Don Byer a national treasure? Yes! <laughs> Bob Ritchie and so many of the rest of us have tried for a long time to get members to focus on what we need to do to fix our institutions. Most of them just don't care or have the bandwidth to look at broadly the ways in which we can make things better. And Don is a leader in that effort, as are some of the others who are co-sponsoring this terrific piece of legislation. The house is broken. You can look at it now and see how pathetic it is inability to act on almost every crucial issue facing the country, taking us to the brink with the debt ceiling, with the budget. We still don't know at this point whether we're going to have a shutdown starting tomorrow. And it is just not a good way to operate. But it's more than what we see now. They can't choose a speaker. They can't get legislation through. But if you look at what the framers had in mind for the House of Representatives, it was supposed to be the body closest to the people that represented all the different groups in the society, all would come together, broadly represented the forces out there, and debate and deliberate, and then act on issues, especially where there was a broad public view and even a consensus that we needed to act and what to do about it. And that's gone now. If the framers were around today, they'd be appalled to see where the house is. Now, some of this is a much larger problem in our society that we see playing out now and we'll see it playing out through the rest of the year. But it has to start with structural change, and this is the place to start. 
We need to move away from a system that's distorted our politics and distorted the membership of Congress. And we need to create a system that takes us back closer to what the framers had in mind. I've been a part of a commission of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences on citizenship. We have the broadest representation across the political spectrum. We issued a report with a whole series of recommendations called Our Common Purpose. And these two were the centerpiece of what we wanted to do. And this is not just theoretical. One of the things, if you look back at history, in Illinois, their state legislature for many decades had multi-member districts, three members, and voters had three votes to cast. They could cast one each for three, two for one and one for another, or three for one individual. And what it did was to have heterogeneous districts where you had to represent a much wider range of people. It meant that you got a broader group of candidates, including people who would not otherwise run for office. It meant that the rhetoric changed. You weren't going to alienate everybody else and just appeal to the extremes. It ended up with a better and more efficient system. Now, going back to the same tired model that we have of single member districts with plurality voting, the Illinois legislature is just like most of our state legislatures, broken, divided, tribalized, just like all the rest. This would be a giant set of steps forward to heal the wounds of this country and enable us to deal with the critical problems that we face, from immigration to climate change to the racial inequities that we have in the society to dealing with the border, areas and guns, areas where we know we have a broad ability to work together because that's what the American people want but this Congress won't even address it. So let's do everything we can, put our shoulders to the wheel, get other members to appreciate this, and see if we can bring us back to the kind of democracy we deserve and that our framers had in mind. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cynthia Ritchie Terrell. Cynthia is a longtime leader in the election reform movement. She serves as the founder and executive director of Represent Women, uh, and is, she is an outspoken advocate for institutional reforms to advance women's representation and leadership in the United States. Welcome, Cynthia. ranks behind 75 countries for women's representation. Perhaps more importantly, we rank near the bottom of the OECD nations for women's representation. And this really undercuts our role on the world stage in every kind of negotiation we endeavor to do and in our policy making processes at home. We're simply not doing a good job at representing all of the people in the United States. Representation for women in countries that use proportional representation, some version of the Fair Representation Act, is much higher. Women do much better in countries with proportional representation, particularly in countries like Australia, which uses the exact replica of the Fair Representation Act, ranked choice voting in multi-seat districts in the upper house, in the Senate. Women hold 57% of those seats. Imagine the difference. Minnesota, to Santa Fe, to New Mexico, to New York City, to Maine, to Arlington, Virginia. Women are much more likely to win in ranked choice voting elections. And in that Arlington race that Don was describing, excuse me, Congressman Byer was describing earlier, <laughs> it was two women who won that proportional ranked choice voting election. So women hold 53% of the council seats in jurisdictions with ranked choice voting, which is about 20% higher than in non- RCV races, and about 45% of the mayoral races in jurisdictions with ranked choice voting, significantly higher than jurisdictions without ranked choice voting. And women are more likely to get recruited to run and therefore to win in multi-seat districts, as is true in my home state of Maryland that elects state legislators in multi-winner districts. RCV and multi-seat districts combined mean that more women can run without hurting each other's chances and voters are free to support women candidates without fear that they'll split the vote. 
I began advocating for ranked choice voting in the last century, which seems like a long time ago, with my husband, Rob Ritchie. <coughs> We were brought to this work because we were energized by the work to modernize electoral systems in other countries. 30 years ago, only a handful of people in the United States were talking about electoral reform, proportional representation, and ranked choice voting. And I'll just mention here in his honor, one of those uh, men was a former member of Congress, John Anderson, who ran for president in 1980 and was uh, a moderate uh, Republican from Illinois who served his country well, served in World War II, and was a big supporter of the Fair Representation Act and served as the chair of the Fair Vote Board for many years. But now ranked choice voting is the fastest growing election reform in the nation. Americans are yearning for a government that reflects our interests, our lived experiences, and our values. And the Fair Representation Act is the magic elixir to build the government we dream of. Thank you.
Maybe that's why it has some establishment politicians running scared. Here in D.C. today, some council members are not only trying to block Initiative 83, they want to take away the voters' power to propose any ballot initiatives in the future. Can you believe that? No! Oh. Oh. We're not alone. All across the country, politicians have tried to do the same thing. Make it hard to get initiatives on the ballot and even harder to get them passed. I'm honored to stand alongside everyone gathered here today to fight for a better democracy. Yay. Yes. We must strive together for electoral systems that empower majorities who will hold their elected officials accountable. I commend the authors of the Fair Representation Act. I look forward to working with you to secure a more responsive, more representative democracy, both nationally and right here in my hometown, Washington, D.C. vision of religious freedom for people of all faiths and none. Please welcome Reverend Paul. Don't get scared because it's a Baptist preacher. <laughs> As I said, my name is uh, Reverend Paul Brand S. Rauschmusch. I'm the president of Interfaith Alliance. We're a 30-year-old civic institution that celebrates the diversity of religious beliefs in America. Amen. <laughs> Our nation was founded to ensure that each person has the freedom to express our religious convictions equally, and our country is fortunate to have in every state, in every city, a vibrant and diverse religious landscape. And this, is, this diversity is the reason I'm standing here today and honored to support Representative Byer, uh, and Representative Raskin and Fairvote and all of these new friends that are standing behind me to support the Fair Representation Act. This bill works to make our democracy as fair as possible by creating ways that our country's remarkable diversity, including religious diversity, has representation in Congress, further ensuring that our democracy works for all and that all people, including those from minority faith traditions, feel heard in Washington, D.C. Yes. yes. This is not a partisan issue. Rather, it is a moral one, inspired by a commitment to equity, respect, and inclusion for people of all backgrounds, ensuring that our democracy doesn't just work for some, but for all. We are unfortunately in a moment of extreme alienation and distrust for many who wonder if this country and those who lead truly care about their dreams and their material needs. The Fair Representation Act answers that with a definitive yes. Yes to a government that truly represents our diversity. Yes to a government that invites contributions from the wide spectrum of religious and political beliefs, and yes to a country that reduces polarization, reduces extremism, and fulfills the promise of e pluribus unum. Under the many, we can be one. Support the Fair Representation Act. Thank you. Hey. Question for uh, Congressman Byer. Uh, uh, WTOP. As you're well aware, your uh, colleagues uh, in the GOP have gotten used to being primaried over the last few years. Have you seen any interest from any Republicans in either co-sponsoring your legislation or at least moving in this direction? Um, not enough yet to get anybody to co-sponsor. We talked with them a lot about it. The, the, the real
real dilemma, Mitch, is that this Foreign Representation Act appeals most to people who have not yet been elected. <laughs> and uh, you know, so Republicans in Massachusetts are really excited about it. Democrats in Oklahoma are excited about it. Okay. Uh, the challenge, too, is that the leadership tends to be people who have been very successful in the existing system. Um, so they like the way that it happened. There are also a surprising number of people here who won primaries by pluralities and think, Fair Representation Act work, I might not be here today. So this is why we grow slowly rather than quickly because it's such a good idea. And on the flip side, <laughs> on the flip side, are you encouraged by the fact that there has been an increase in ranked choice voting uh, elections? I think what Fair Vote has done over the last 10 years is astonishing. It's just so, so much fun to read the clips every day and see yet another place that's considering ranked choice voting. In the meantime, Virginia's authorized it at the local government, so we're pushing Alexandria and Fairfax all surge. You know, with every success, by the way, I'm, I'm, we're thrilled that we have Mary Peltola because of ranked choice voting and Jared Woo Golden because of ranked choice voting. Although I'm really rooting for a Republican to come here because of ranked choice voting. Because yeah. uh, the worst thing is to associate RCV with Democratic success. Because it's really the success of everybody across the political spectrum. so much for coming. Uh, please join us in, in the future fights, trying to get more co-sponsors on the Fair Representation Act. Enjoy the wonderful spring day, and again, thank you.